All right, I think we can go ahead and just start with the intro and then I'll admit people as they join. Um, so hello everyone, welcome to the UT Electrical, Electrochemical Society's uh, new webinar series. Uh, my name is Sham Sharma and I'm the Vice President of the UTECS chapter. Uh, I'm also a second year material science and engineering student uh, working in Dr. Arumagam Mandaram's group. So on the first Thursday of every month, the UT ECS chapter will be hosting uh, expert speakers from industry, academia, and national laboratories to share uh, practical perspectives on electrochemical technologies. So today we're really excited to have Dr. Henry Louis from Seattle University, and he'll be presenting on the role of energy storage in ending energy poverty. So uh, before I introduce Dr. Louis and hand it over to him, I'd like to quickly go over uh, some housekeeping items. Uh, if anyone is interested in joining uh, the UT ECS chapter, uh, feel free to email me or um, uh, Jason Weeks, who's the president. While most of our in-person programs have been halted due to COVID, uh, we're looking to expand our virtual events um, and would be happy to hear any suggestions from current or new members uh, with regard to uh, ideas for events. Uh, for this webinar, I'd like to ask everyone to please keep their microphones muted and cameras off. Uh, and after Dr. Louis's presentation, we've allocated some time for Q&A. Uh, so if anyone has questions that come up during the presentation, feel free to write them in the chat and I can read those out uh, at the end of the presentation. And also if time allows, um, after the questions have been asked, we can kind of open up the floor for general discussion. So now I'm very excited to introduce Dr. Henry Louis, our speaker. Uh, Dr. Henry Louis received his bachelor's uh, from Kettering University in 2002 and his master's uh, from University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign in 2004 and then finally his PhD in electrical engineering from the University of Washington in 2008. He is a professor in the EC department at Seattle University. Uh, in 2015 he was a Fulbright Scholar to Copper Belt University uh, in Kitwe, Zambia. Uh, he is also president and co-founder of Kilowatts for Humanity which is a nonprofit organization providing off-grid electrical access to uh, communities in Sub-Saharan Africa. Dr. Louis is an associate editor for Energy for Sustainable Development and is a founding member of the IEEE PES Working Group on Sustainable Energy Systems for Developing Communities. Dr. Louis is recognized as an IEEE Distinguished Lecturer for his expertise on energy poverty. He is a senior member of the IEEE and was a registered professional engineer in Zambia. He previously served as Vice President of Membership and Image uh, for the IEEE Power and Energy Society. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to Dr. Henry Louis for his lecture on the role of energy storage in ending energy poverty. Uh, Dr. Louis, it's all yours. All right, thank you, thank you. Let me just, uh, as soon as I'm able here, I'll share my screen and we can get started. Okay, I trust that you can see my, my screen. Uh, so let's get started. So it's uh, fantastic to be talking to all of you today. And I'll begin by just saying, I am uh, not uh, an expert in electrochemistry, but uh, I do use batteries a lot in what I do in Sub-Saharan Africa in particular. So I'm gonna talk about uh, the role of energy storage in ending energy poverty. And most of you, I, I would guess, probably aren't familiar with the term energy poverty or the context of rural electrification. So my talk will address the need for energy storage and then the applications. And I'll try to sprinkle in areas where I think we need more uh, attention given. And uh, maybe that'll inspire you to, to pursue that in your research uh, in the future. Okay. So um, one thing that that's I, um, I want to talk about at the beginning here is that in addition to being a professor, I run a nonprofit organization called Kilowatts for Humanity. And uh, a lot of the examples that I'm going to give today are from experiences with that nonprofit organization. So just a little bit about us. What we do as an organization is we try to improve people's lives by providing access to electricity and fostering that with the development of sustainable businesses. Um, so that's, that's two things we do. We don't just drop in electricity, parachute it in. Uh, we actually like to see it used in productive ways. And so what we do is we always partner with in-country 
organizations that know communities well that can help manage and maintain the electrical systems that we help design and implement. And, uh, and then they use it in a way that uh, boosts the local, uh, the local economy there. So <laughs> I just included some pictures here from some of our, our um, installations. And what I'm trying to highlight in these images is the, the use of electricity in these rural areas. I'll get into the statistics later, but it's very, very common in rural areas all across Sub-Saharan Africa and different parts of the world for there not to be really any electricity, any grid connected electricity. And so when you bring electricity to that community, it really unlocks a lot of potential. Uh, you can see in the upper left, one of the biggest users of electricity, or, or at least the most common or sought after, is to charge cell phones. Now, believe it or not, a, a very large portion of families in rural areas will actually have cell phones despite the fact that the electric grid isn't there. So if you don't have these off, what I call off-grid systems, that family then has to take their phone and walk to the nearest town, or maybe if they're lucky, they have a bicycle. Uh, and go to the nearest town that does have electricity where they're going to pay maybe 20 or 25 cents to recharge their phone. And that doesn't sound like a lot of money to you and I, but remember the average daily income in these rural areas might be, you know, $1.50 or $2 a day. So if you're spending 20 to maybe 50 cents on recharging your phone, it's a significant part of your income. And then we see electricity used in, in uh, more creative ways, like making ice to preserve fish, for example. Um, selling cold sodas, which you can see at the bottom, is a, a, a real treat in a rural area. Having anything cold to drink, even if probably, you know, uh, that's like the uh, police show movies on this and they charge a little bit of an admission fee. Um, our uh, barber shops, uh, small grocery stores, uh, sewing machines, chicken incubators. So it can really have a big uh, a transformative effect in these rural communities when they get access to electricity for the first, uh, for the first time. On the next couple of slides, I'm just gonna show you some images of some of the installations that we've worked on with Kilowatts for Humanity, just so you get an idea of the, the type of situation that I'll be talking about. So most of these installations are what we call energy kiosks, and they are a few kilowatts in size. So you might have neighbors that have more uh, solar panels on their roofs uh, than these whole communities have, but nonetheless, they provide meaningful electricity uh, to these communities. So here are a couple that we've done in, in Kenya and, and Zambia, and here's a, a few more. The top one is installed in a repurposed shipping container. There's actually a little store inside that shipping container. This one is uh, in, in a community called Cheba, and usually when, as soon as the installation is complete, that night we show a, a movie, and you can see all the little kids watching the movie as it just is the, about to start down here on this white screen. So it's always kind of a fun, fun little way to celebrate. I mean, you can imagine growing up in a, one of these rural communities, never having access to electricity, and then all of a sudden you have a movie night and you get to watch, uh, I think one of the kids' favorites is the Jungle Book that we'll put on. Um, but you can just imagine how, how much of a novelty uh, that is, and also just uh, how modern all of a sudden your, your little community might feel having that availability. You, know, you feel like you're, you're living in the town uh, in a way. Our most recent installation was in a, a community called Kinchomba, and this was uh, a five kilowatt system with a one kilowatt uh, solar pump. And, uh, and I'll talk more about this one in particular uh, a little bit later. Okay, so with that sort of background in mind, let's talk about energy poverty. So what do we, we're probably familiar with poverty as it, uh, as it, um, is uh, used to describe income or, or wealth, but what do we mean by energy poverty? Well, quite simply, energy poverty is the lack of access to modern fuels. And by modern fuels, what we mean is uh, 
like electricity and propane, natural gas, that sort of thing is what we would call a modern fuel. Now, almost 3 billion people still rely on solid biomass for cooking and heating. They're using things like charcoal, fuel wood, et cetera, to cook every day and to heat their homes. And about 800 billion uh, don't have access to electricity. I mean, that's a staggering amount. And about 10 years ago, it was over a billion. So thankfully the number is, is dropping, but you know, one out of eight, one out of nine people on, on the planet not having access to electricity is uh, I think a shocking statistic. So if you are in a situation where you're energy impoverished, you probably consume low amounts of energy overall. You just don't have access to convenient energy. You're probably relying on your own uh, muscles or, or animal power to do mechanical tasks like uh, farming and tilling and pumping water. You uh, are very aware of your energy use because you probably spend a lot of time procuring that energy and then uh, processing the wood or the charcoal, et cetera. In fact, some studies show that uh, it might take 20 hours a week to, um, to gather and process the, the fuel for a household. And most of that gathering and processing is done by women and young girls. And so you, that's quite an opportunity cost for them to not be in school or to not socially develop otherwise, to not learn things. Instead, they're going and grabbing wood and cutting it. And in addition, uh, you probably spend a, lot, a large portion of your income on fuel, maybe 10 to 30% even of your income goes towards fuel. And it's, it's really hard then to um, save up money for school fees or medicine if so much of your income is going towards just getting fuel. Now, um, there, there's a relationship between access to energy or at least energy use and the development or well-being of a country. And this plot tries to capture that. And what it shows is on the x-axis the per person energy use. Okay, so per person energy use, not necessarily electricity, but, but energy in total. And on the Y axis is the Human Development Index, or HDI. And so what the HDI is, is it's an attempt by the United Nations to, to quantify the well being of a, of a country. And it considers three things. Three things that I think we all agree would go into, uh, uh, you know, defining the, or describing the well-being of a, of a community or country. The first is health. So how long do people live? The second is education. How much education do people have? And the third is income. Although this is not a perfect measure, you can think about having those three things and you're probably all right if you're educated, healthy, and, and wealthy, right? So it takes these, uh, these general ideas, and, and of course there's more robust and well-defined metrics behind it, and uh, it rolls it up into a number that generally is between zero and one. And so what we see when we plot the different countries versus uh, or the pro plot the different countries per person energy use and human development index, we see that as energy use increases, the human development index also increases, right? And so that suggests that when people gain access to energy, they reinvest it in ways that make their lives better that make them more healthy, uh, more educated, earn more money. Now, we'll, we'll also see that there's kind of a saturation effect that occurs, right? So giving somebody in, say, Japan access to a little more energy, we probably wouldn't expect their human development index to rise sharply. But if you go to this other end over here, somebody in, say, South Sudan or Niger, if they gain access and, and can consume a little bit more energy, we might expect their human development index to increase significantly. Now, this isn't just conjecture. If we go back in time uh, and look at where China was in the 1970s and 1980s, they were somewhere down here and, and, and they've risen and, and moved up this, uh, this curve. So the whole idea here is that if we give people a little bit more energy, they're gonna use it in ways that make their lives fundamentally better. So let's look at those 800 million people that don't have access to electricity. Where do we find them? Well, most are in Sub-Saharan Africa. 
uh, with maybe 20% uh, in South Asia and about 10% in the rest of the world, Latin America, et cetera. Uh, but it's also worth noting that there are places even here in the United States that struggle with grid connected electricity uh, in, in mostly remote, remote rural areas and also on some of the, uh, the, the reservations in this, uh, that we have around here. So if we crunch the numbers and we, we want to quantify access to electricity, we use something called the electrification rate. And that's simply the population whose house is connected to the national grid divided by the total population. It's the most straightforward uh, way of calculating it, but it's also a, um, there's some problems with this calculation because even if you have a grid connection, it doesn't mean that that's really good quality access. Uh, it could be that the grid is down uh, eight or 10 hours a day or more. That's when I lived in Zambia. That's what we experienced eight hours a day. We didn't have electricity. It doesn't mean that the electricity is cheap or uh, safe, et cetera. But nonetheless, this is the most straightforward metric that's used. And we can see that the electrification rate has been increasing over time. And uh, it's somewhere in the, the 90s, low 90s percent, which is, which is fantastic. Um, but we still have a long way to go. And of course, this isn't evenly spread across countries, right? So some countries have really, really low electrification rates. Uh, Burundi, Chad, Burkina Faso, they're sort of in the 10 to 15% electrification rate. I mean, that would be like, you know, if we look at who's part of this webinar, maybe just uh, two of us having access to electricity, right? Just imagine how different your life would be if you happen to grow up in one of these areas. So when we start to think about interventions or electricity access programs that might work in rural communities, we really need to understand that there's different users. The, the needs of a household is going to be different than the needs of a house of worship or a medical clinic or a school, and that's going to be different than the needs of a uh, agricultural uh, processing company or you know, uh, some other business, right? So we, we have different levels or different services that we might target. And most of what I'm going to talk about is going to look at household and community service use. And so at that scale, uh, there are a couple of couple of options that we could pursue. Um, and I think it's important to think of the technology as a continuum. So there's a lot of different solutions that might fit different situations. So here are just the, I would, what I would classify as the four major categories. The first is we have what, what's called solar lanterns. And if you like to go camping here in the United States, maybe you have what we would call a solar lantern. It's a very, very small solar panel connected to maybe a few LED lights and uh, it's power, it gives you just enough juice to uh, you know, keep that light on for a few hours at night. And then we move up to solar home systems, which now have much larger solar panels, much larger batteries, might be lead acid, might be lithium ion, and maybe it can power fans and TVs uh, even. And then we move up to energy kiosks, where now we're talking kilowatt size systems and you know, battery storage and the, the tens of kilowatt hours. And now we can do things like power freezers and pumps, and we are now getting into that more uh, business to uh, productive use side of things. And then finally, we have mini grids. Um, and mini grids more or less uh, replicate the national grid. So it would be what we would be familiar with here in the United States. The electricity is more or less always on. You have it in your house, you have it. Uh, your neighbor's house perhaps and the businesses and they're all just connected to this AC grid. Um, and so each one of these provides different levels of, of service which you might target for different communities. Now I'm gonna focus mostly on the energy kiosks and mini grids, but I'll talk briefly next about solar lanterns and solar home systems. So here's just an, an example of like what a solar lantern might look like, right? We have a, a PV module and then we have you know, some, some small battery and charge controlling circuit here, and maybe we're powering a light, and maybe if it's large enough, a mobile phone. So some people uh, aren't uh, able to afford anything else but a solar lantern. So these might be as low as five or $10, um, and they can get more expensive from there depending on their extra functionality. Solar home systems then are able to perhaps power multiple lights, indoor lights, outdoor lights, fans, radios, 
And most people aren't satisfied with staying at the solar lantern level. Instead, they want to move up what we call this energy ladder and start uh, having larger systems and, and so on. So what people really want, though, is, is electricity that's similar to what you would find in an, in an urban area. They want to have TVs and, and refrigerators and, and all of that. Of course, there's many barriers to, uh, in the way for, for that to actually happen at, at scale. So I thought I'd give you some, uh, some data for some research that we did that was just looking at the typical battery size versus PV size for solar lanterns and solar home systems, just so you get an idea of, of the scale. Now, I'm an electrical engineer, so I usually work in the world of watt hours, um, but the, the voltages that we're talking about in these batteries are usually quite small, three or three volts, four volts, something like that. Solar home systems, now we get up into the nominal 12 volt, uh, 12 volt range. So you can see that on the solar lantern side, the PV cells are really small. I mean, a lot of them are even less than one watt, and same with the batteries. And on the solar home system side, everything gets much larger, uh, the battery capacities can be much, much bigger as well um, and, uh, and because they're designed to just power more things in the EV. So how many of these solar home systems and solar lanterns are out there? Well, a lot. Millions and millions and millions. Um, if we just look at the first half of this year, uh, over 3 million off-grid solar lighting products were, were uh, sold. And this is certainly an undercount uh, because this only this survey was done only uh, including certain vendors and suppliers that, that opted in to provide their data. And there's certainly a, a lot more like knockoff and fake ones that find their way to Sub-Saharan Africa in particular. So we have millions and millions of these devices that are out there. And uh, we've been selling you know, in the millions for the last uh, few years. So, uh, so they're out there, and I think one of the challenges with this is the batteries don't last forever, as, as you may well know. And so we're actually starting to generate uh, a lot of e-waste around this. So we, we get millions of products out there each year. They might have a lifespan of a, you know, five years, something like that. What do we do with the devices once, uh, once they're bad? That's an, sort of an open question here. It's really hard to collect and recycle them while still making money. If we look at mini grids and energy kiosks, these are much larger systems, you know, costing 10,000 to hundreds of thousands of dollars. They serve much, uh, many more people um, than a single solar home system, of course, but there's far fewer of these. There's maybe 10,000, something like that. Um, but there's a big potential for mini grids. Over um, 100 million households could be served by mini grids in Sub-Saharan Africa. And in many of these places, uh, a, a typical household size might be seven people, right? So that's that we're talking hundreds of millions of people could be served by mini grids. So um, we're hoping that mini grids are able to proliferate and, uh, and get somewhere close to this amount. Okay. So with that background in mind, now we're gonna to transition to talking about some of the more technical aspects of these systems. So I'll start by going over some of the components and architectures that we see. So when, I, when we think about mini grids, remember these are sort of like the national grid, but well, mini. And we could break it up into three systems. We have the energy production system, the distribution system, which are like our power lines and maybe transformers if the grid is large enough, and then everything that goes in to the uh, user's home, including the, the meters and the outlets and so forth. I'm really gonna focus on that first part, the energy production system, and I won't talk about designing the power lines, but we're gonna talk about how we create the energy and how we store it, and a little bit about how we might control it. So um, these are the typical building blocks that you would see in an off-grid system. We have the energy conversion technology, the storage, there's usually converters and controllers, although not always, and then some sort of load, either AC or DC, or perhaps a combination of, of the both. Um, in terms of the, the energy production system, I mean, most of the time we use solar now uh, because it's really sunny in areas that struggle with uh, energy poverty. And uh, you can see here in Sub-Saharan Africa, they get a, a, their a radiance that they receive is, is quite, quite high. So solar is more or less the default 
that we use, although you might see some other types of generation. So I'll focus on solar then in this talk. So this is a typical off-grid system. We might have one or more solar modules. We usually use a charge controller to connect it to what we call the DC bus. So you can think of the DC bus as just sort of a node in the system. We'll always have a battery. And if we want to serve an AC load, we need a device called an inverter, which just con converts DC to AC so that whatever the load is, is compatible with, ever, with the voltage that we're supplying. So that's all there is. It's, it's, can be quite simple and, and straightforward. Now, often we have multiple batteries, multiple PV modules, et cetera, but um, this, is, this is the basic architecture. So although solar is, is the dominant form now, we could also use just conventional generator sets like backup generators. If you go to Lowe's or Home Depot in, in the United States, you can go buy one uh, if you want to go camping or something and have electricity. It's nothing too, too special about that. We might also use wind turbines or hydro turbines, but those require very specific resource qualities, which are, are, can be hard to, um, to know in advance if it's going to be windy enough. And uh, if you're going to do hydro, then you have to build a big penstock and manage the water. So solar is usually the easiest. Uh, just to give you an idea of what I'm talking about, here are some pictures of what those look like in the field here. There's lots of different types of water turbines that can be used depending on the water resource. So inside the powerhouse or, or um, wherever where our electricity is being produced, you know, you're gonna have a lot of devices that are usually wall mounted. And most importantly, you'll see charge controllers and an inverter as well as batteries and the batteries aren't shown in this picture. Uh, this happened to be a, a wind and solar mini grid. So there's some other devices here like rectifiers, which take the AC from the wind turbines and convert it to DC. And then we have some other controllers just to make sure that the wind turbines don't damage themselves if it gets too windy. Uh, here, here are different, different uh, components for different size systems. This is maybe like a 300 watt system at a school. And this is a mini grid that is like, I think 40 kilowatts in size, so, so quite big. Now the batteries that are deployed in these systems really depend, um, and they, I mean, they vary and they depend on, you know, your appetite for upfront costs versus operational costs, et cetera. Uh, but this would be like a typical battery bank for flooded lead acid. These are six volt batteries and it's a 48 volt system. So they're all connected in series, as you might be able to see here. Uh, this is for a much larger mini grid. These are usually two volt batteries, uh, sealed lead acid, so low maintenance. And now what we're seeing more and more are lithium ion batteries making their way out into these rural areas. And uh, this is, uh, I think about 20 kilowatt hours at 48 volts, uh, something like that total. So let's talk about energy storage and I'm not gonna get into the electrochemis electrochemistry, but um, basically we need the DC, we need uh, batteries to establish the DC bus voltage. Otherwise we don't have a good way of controlling it. it can be done, but it's hard to do. Uh, but importantly for us, uh, batteries are basically the single most expensive component and the one that is going to be shortest lived. So we care a lot about our batteries and we also are very much aware that how we operate our system can affect the lifespan of our batteries. So we, it stresses us out in a way to think about how we can we design and size our system to prolong battery life. In addition to their high cost, it's really a pain to get out into these rural areas to uh, replace batteries. Okay, so there's an added cost of getting there and removing and, and, and uh, replacing batteries. So uh, I like to think of batteries decoupling the time when energy is produced from when it's consumed. Okay, so this is on the right, the, the power uh, to the battery over the course of a day for a typical solar off-grid system. The battery basically is inhaling during the day and during the night it's exhaling. And so we usually have one cycle then, one charge, dis charge, dis charge cycle per day. And uh, it often will look like this, of course, not always. The batteries that we see in off-grid systems, I mean, they're all gonna be rechargeable. And most of the time now it's going to be uh, lead or lithium ion. And the, the balance is starting to shift to more lithium ion, but we typically see uh, LIFEPO batteries uh, 
going out into the systems, although there's still a lot of lead acid batteries that are out there. So you probably are all familiar with, with the cycle life of batteries, uh, but if you're not, I'll go over it here, at least from the perspective of somebody who does off-grid electrification. Um, you know, batteries start to degrade immediately, essentially, and uh, we have to be aware of when they reach their end of life, which often is defined at 80% when their maximum capacity drops to 80% of their new capacity. We also know that how quickly it's going to reach its it, end of its life is going to depend on how deeply we, we discharge that battery um, and, and the, the number of cycles, of course, right? So we hit these, these strange nonlinear plots that look like this, and, uh, and we try to come up with our best estimates of where we're going to end up in terms of average depth of discharge and what that might mean for cycle life, and we'll design our systems accordingly. Now there's a problem here, because if you look at batteries and how they're specced, um, you know, they're, they're basically making the assumption of constant current discharge in a temperature controlled environment. And an off-grid mini-grid solar home system, what, ha what have you, is, couldn't be further from this. So we're not in temperature-controlled environments. We're in places where the temperature could get above 35 degrees Celsius. Um, there are, the load is going to change. So it's not a constant current withdrawal. In fact, in most homes, the current that is being discharged is zero until the sun sets, and then it peaks for a few hours and then it goes, um, goes quite low again until morning time before it drops to zero. So we're tasked then with translating these, these capacity values that were uh, tested at constant current and figuring out what that means for our particular system. On top of, on top of all of that uncertainty, is it's really challenging to guess what someone, how much electricity uh, a household is going to use if they've never used electricity before. Okay. And in fact, there's a lot of error associated with just that step of the process of figuring out how big should we make our, our system uh, because we just don't know how much electricity people are going to use. So, uh, you know, we're very much aware that how we charge and discharge our battery affects its life. And so you'll often see charge controllers that we use. And here's just a really simple schematic of how they work. I mean, we, we typically will sense voltage and maybe temperature of the battery. We, of course, only know the terminal voltage. And then we, we will have a switch that we operate to control the current into the battery, more or less to control the voltage level or the current going into the battery, right? So that's how these things typically work. And uh, as you might be familiar with, uh, lead acid batteries use this three-stage charging which in a textbook looks something like this. We, we try to dump as much current into the battery when the sun comes up, battery voltage rises, and then we want to regulate the, the voltage so as we don't so basically not over voltage or have those other reactions occur with the battery. And then when we think the battery is full, because remember, we don't know if it's full, we just know the terminal voltage, and it's not open circuit, so there's always current going into and out of it, so it's really hard to know the state of charge. Then we drop it down to the float stage, um, and eventually we're not able to keep it at the, the float stage because the sun sets and then the battery starts to discharge. So that's what it looks like in a textbook. Uh, in practice, we see something more like this. So this is the, the power from the sun, uh, and, and this is the power to the loads, and then this is the battery voltage. So uh, overnight, it, it decreases. In the morning, it gets the bulk stage, it rises, and we get to a point here where we reach the absorption stage, and then we start to spill sunlight or throttle the solar. We don't need as much solar, and so we see then just sort of a decrease in solar power as we regulate our voltage. And then we drop down to float, and then at the end of the day, it goes down to zero. So this tells us just by inspection that this battery probably got fully charged. But importantly, it also tells us that we really didn't make much use of the sun that we could have because, you know, this plot would have gone way higher and uh, if we had enough load there. So we probably could have added a lot more daytime load here, which means we could maybe encourage the community to have load during the day. 
this is an example for one, from a day where we might not have enough sun to ever get the battery fully charged, in which case we don't see that nice three-stage charging algorithm happen. That looks something like this. So if we see this sort of profile, the, uh, we might suggest to the operator to try to conserve power overnight, maybe not have as many lights on, et cetera, because the battery is certainly not fully charged at the end of the day. Now, uh, so that's looking at the charging side of it. On the discharging side, how we protect the batteries from over discharge is that inverter, that device that converts DC to AC has a, a low voltage disconnect. So it's sensing the voltage. Uh, it doesn't know directly the state of charge or anything like that, but it's sensing the terminal voltage. And when the terminal voltage gets low, the battery or the inverter uh, disconnects all the load. And so that's what happens uh, at a couple of times during uh, in this data set where that's the, the fully charged voltage level. This is where the low voltage disconnect set point is. And you can see that as the battery becomes uh, deeply discharged and its terminal voltage drops below it, the power to the load goes to zero. Uh, and then the voltage will immediately rise, as I'm sure you're familiar with why. And then when we, uh, uh, and then when, the, when it gets to a high enough, level, high enough level, we'll reconnect and then hopefully the sun is up at that point. Otherwise we just start oscillating back and forth. Um, and, and that's not a good scenario either. Okay, okay so uh, let me, go into a little more detail some of the systems that we've actually done. And we work primarily in Zambia. And uh, I do teach at a Jesuit university, which means I love asking my, question, my students questions. So uh, I'm going to do a geography test here. Uh, which one of these locations is Zambia, A, B, C, or D? And in fact, if you have the chat uh, function open in Zoom, you could go ahead and impress me by chatting uh, where you think Zambia is, A, B, C, or D. There's, it's okay to guess, I'm not expecting to know. I see B, I see C. A lot of people are going for C. Okay. B, nobody's going for A or D. Oh, pretty good. Yeah, that's Zambia right there. It's about the size of Texas. It has about f uh, 16 million or so people living there. And so uh, Zambia is probably best known for Victoria Falls, one of the wonders of the natural world, but there's also a lot of great wildlife. They have a capital city of about, uh, I think, 4 million people, no, 2 million people. Um, a lot of copper comes from there, and there's a lot of rural areas in Zambia as well. Now, as I said earlier, if you go to rural areas like this, you'll almost always find some sort of um, electronic device, right? So here, if we zoom in, this gentleman actually has a little radio that's battery powered. So even though they're nowhere near the grid, there's gonna be electronic devices there. This is, people want them. Uh, they provide a lot of value. So one of the communities that we, we worked with is this uh, women's group in Cheba. And this is a picture of them. Cheba is in the Southern part of Zambia. And uh, through our local partner, uh, Caritas, they identified this community and this women's group as having the sort of entrepreneurial spirit and the organizational capability to basically run an energy kiosk and uh, make money off it, off the electricity that it provides. Yeah, so Chebo is this little community here, and we, the kiosk got installed right here, sort of in the middle of the community. Uh, Chebo, it's fairly small, 350 people, it's actually on this river, which downstream of it is one of the largest hydroelectric dams in uh, that part of uh, South Central Africa. And it's a little sad because these people literally see the power lines, the high voltage power lines from their houses, and, uh, and yet they don't have any benefit from it. So that we, we had a, a system installed, and here you, you can see it. Uh, again, just a bunch of electronics mounted on the wall, more or less. Um, and here you can see the batteries that we have. And these are actually lead carbon batteries. And we, we selected lead carbon partly because we were curious to see if the lifespan would be increased as, as advertised. Um, but we're, this system's just about a year old, so we don't know uh, if the improved lifespan will actually manifest itself. Uh, just some of the technical details about it. So it's a 48 volt battery bank. Um, 
about 20 kilowatt hours. The PV array is about three, uh, three kilowatts. And we designed the system to power sewing machines, phone charging, hair clippers, uh, freezers, uh, et cetera. And here are just some pictures. Uh, we always use Zambian companies to do the installation, so we don't really go and install solar panels ourselves. This is a, a better way of doing it. It's a much more sustainable practice. You get higher quality work than if I have a bunch of volunteers coming from the U.S. to learn how to install, install solar panels. Uh, there's usually a dignitary that comes and does like the ribbon cutting, and then we always send a, a team, well, until COVID happened, we would send a team to commission the kiosk and do some community activities. Um, Oh, yeah, and here's the video uh, that is uh, the movie that's playing at night in Cheva. So you can see all the little kids getting around and it's a nice, nice touching um, experience. Well, what we did this last year, actually about uh, just over a month ago, is we worked in this community called Kinchomba. And uh, instead of working with the women's group, we worked with what they call a young adults group. But in, in Zambia, young adult means like 35 and under. So it's not like a youth you know, what we would call a youth group. It's, it's young, young adults, I suppose. And so we designed the system um, to power fans, freezers. Uh, there's a barber shop and a hair salon, an egg incubator, charging cell phones, and then have a bunch of lighting. So what we did this time is um, we, we worked with the community. They liked the idea of having it. And, and we usually say, well, you got to put some sweat equity in this to show us that you're really commi committed to it. And so they, they constructed, they made their own bricks and constructed this whole kiosk, which is really more like a, I'd call it like a strip mall, uh, because all of these are businesses and they're all gonna be powered by the off-grid solar system. And you can see the nearly completed version of it here. They still have to get the, the veranda completed up, up front. Uh, so this is, this is like uh, now just like an active uh, hub of commerce in this otherwise small and maybe far flung uh, community. And here's what the system looks like. This is our first system that we've used that had lithium ion batteries. And um, we're excited to see how they perform. Uh, we're hoping that they have a better uh, cycle life than the lead acid batteries that we've done in the past. We found that our lead acid batteries that we've installed in, in different installations will only last a few years, maybe half as long as we would expect from the spec sheets of the manufacturer. And we suspect that's uh, largely temperature related. Uh, so we'll, we'll see how these lithium ion batteries perform. And of course we have the same worries about the temperature, ambient temperature affecting them. So uh, I'll close out with just a few thoughts here. Um, things that I want to impress upon you. There's about a billion people that don't have access to electricity, right? It's a shocking number. Uh, Off-grid systems have shown to be viable in providing uh, access to electricity rather than just extending the grid. I think in many of these communities, the, the, it's not realistic that the power grid is ever going to come to them, or at least not for decades. Uh, if we uh, look at why we've seen so much activity in off-grid electrification, uh, one of the reasons is the cost of energy storage has, has come down, particularly lithium ion batteries, and uh, and and that's been a, that's been a game changer. Of course, the cost of solar panels have come down dramatically, and and, and that's important too. But there's we have uh, improvements that need to happen on the battery side uh, to to really let us reach the most poor uh, and, and to provide the highest quality service batteries. So I mean, the price needs to come down quite simply. Um, we also run into issues with recycling, not only lead acid batteries, but lithium ion batteries. There's really no place in Sub-Saharan Africa that you can take a lithium ion battery to, uh, to, to have it safely recycled or disposed. I mean, they, they kind of just get discarded. Um, personally, related to you know, what my organization and many other organizations uh, worry about is, having a better understanding of just how long our batteries are going to last when they're actually out there in the field. As we get more and more of these, these uh, off-grid systems deployed, we have more data and we can better understand this. Uh, but the, the typical technique of constant current discharge at um, a controlled temperature environment doesn't really do us a lot of good. Yeah, it doesn't do us a lot of good. Uh, and so we need better ways of understanding and rating them uh, according to what actually happens in the field. 
And so finally, let me, uh, before we open it up for questions, let me, let me leave you with this thought. Um, you know, if you're on this webinar, you're probably a, a, an ambitious, intelligent person. And maybe you see yourself when you graduate with your, your master's degree, your PhD, you're going to go work for some tech company designing phones or something like that. We look at a company like Apple, right? It's probably the, has the highest market capitalization, I think. Uh, think about all the talent, right? All the tens and thousands of designers and engineers attracting the brightest minds from literally all over the world. Almost unlimited resources to design and invent. And you think about what we get from that massive talent, the world's best and brightest, right? We get a phone that's incrementally better every year. Oh, and by the way, maybe 1% of the world would be able to afford it. Maybe 0.1%. So is that really what we should be doing as humanity? Our best and brightest going out there to design devices that just the smallest fraction of humanity can benefit from? So I would challenge you then to think about how you can use your talents and your ambition to affect the greatest portion of the world, right? That other 90, 99%, figure out a way to make their lives better. So with that, uh, I'll, I'll happily end and open it up to, uh, to any questions. Thank you, Professor Lewis. It was a great talk. Um, does anyone have any questions uh, they'd like to start with? I have one, if not. I see a couple of hands raised. Sure. Oh uh, yeah, Brian, you want to go ahead? Yeah, sure. Uh, I wanted to say that was a really great talk. I really enjoyed it. And I was wondering, could you touch on what you see as some of the biggest constraints limiting the for-profit deployment of these systems by those local companies? Yeah, so th there are quite a few for-profit companies that are out there. Um, I don't know if any, or at least not many, are turning profits right now, right? They're still kind of figuring it out. Um, this might sound like a very glib response, but uh, the, I think the biggest problem is that the people that they are serving are poor. They don't have a lot of money. There's not a lot of, lot of money uh, out there in these rural communities. Okay. So, uh, so the margins are going to be small. They also suffer from the fact that there's not a friendly regulatory environment for them. Uh, almost all grids in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, the electricity that people pay is subsidized heavily by the government. So the government sees that, so it's not cost-reflective cost pricing. Well, that doesn't extend to these mini-grid operators. And, and so they're actually having to uh, sell their electricity, you know, at cost, essentially, um, or like what the levelized cost is, not lower. And that's actually quite high. And, uh, you know, it, it it's hard to do. So they're trying to do it totally uns unsubsidized without the benefit of government support, without the benefit of economies of scale uh, in these rural areas. And that's going to be tough, you know, tough on them. So they're having to come up with ways, very innovative ways of, of um, making the designs as slim as they need to be, not overbuilding them, not underbuilding them, uh, being able to communicate with the rural uh, customers and users, having a like on the ground uh, presence, uh, there's a lot of soft costs that go into these systems. You know, you have to go, it, I didn't talk about this at all, but we spend a lot of time just identifying which communities we want to be active in. Um, that's a lot of time that can be a lot of, a lot of expense. So it's sort of like all of the above needs to get better. Uh, there's a lot of improvements that we've seen in remote monitoring of these assets where you, you can get a sense of how they're performing, pay as you go. Uh, so instead of a customer having to save up $100 for a solar home system, they can pay a few dollars a month. That, that's great. It's, you're starting to understand who are the good customers, who has good credit, and so forth. Um, so those are some of the barriers, and I could keep going about the barriers. Uh, but that being said, oh, the, the progress that we've made, you know, just in the 10 plus years that I've been involved, it's, it's amazing the techno how, how quickly the technologies have changed and how widespread this is becoming. So I'm optimistic that we'll, we'll, we'll get there. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Anybody else? Um, oh yeah. Someone asked in the chat. Um, so the question is, uh, it seems like cycle life is the real issue with these systems, irrespective of energy density. 
Is this true or are there times where a more compact or lightweight battery is needed? Yeah, so it depends a little bit on the scale uh, of, of the size that you're talking about. So solar, solar lanterns, solar home systems, you can make it the argument that there is uh, an energy density premium to be paid for that because they're, they can be designed to be portable, although solar home systems, we generally think you know, you install them in your home and you leave them there. At the higher end, not really. Uh, we don't really care so much about energy density. There's usually lots of space uh, and we would care more about um, that, uh, the, the cycle life. That, that's probably the most important. Uh, so I can actually ask my question. Um, so we talked a lot about the kind of the technical challenges with designing and implementing these systems. What would you say is the biggest non-technical challenge uh, on the community level or, you know? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think the economics is, is hard. Um, and, and uh, of course, sort of steeped in that is, is understanding the community and its, uh, its social aspects. So here's an example. Um, most of the households that you connect to say a mini grid are gonna consume so little electricity that you're never gonna recoup the cost of running the wire and buying the meter to connect them. Uh, and, and that's a problem, right? Because it's sort of dead, if you're thinking of it strictly from like an economic perspective, that's sort of dead weight, right? Uh, so you, you kind of make guesses as to who are gonna be the users that actually consume a lot. So you might find that you know, 15% of the, the users consume 80% of the total electricity. Right, and then everyone else doesn't consume that much. Uh, so, if you understand the community, uh, who's in the community, what their incomes are, et cetera, you might be able to figure that out better. Right, and connect more of the people that are going to be using it. The reason why people aren't using it is it's usually economic. They're paying for the electricity, uh, and, and and maybe they just can't afford it, or they can't afford to have appliances. Thank you. I have a question. Um, so most of the installations you mentioned during the presentation uh, were primarily solar PV. But there were also a couple of instances where you talked about using uh, small scale wind energy. And so when you do that at the system level, um, you have greater complexity and therefore greater cost in terms of power electronics but perhaps greater versatility in terms of the energy generation. So um, I guess, can you comment on what the advantage of including wind as opposed to you know, allocating that funding to just expand the solar PV array would be? Yeah, great question, yeah. So you would be interested in a hybrid wind solar system if you thought it was windy at night. And the cost of adding the wind turbines meant you would have to install fewer batteries. Yeah, that's sort of the, the dream there, complementary energy uh, profiles, right? Uh, the problem with that, I think, is even if it's windy at night or tends to be windy at night, it's not always windy at night. Um, and it's really hard to know and, and feel confident uh, that it would, in fact, be windy at night, right? Y you are talking about trying to figure out the average wind speed, you know, 10 plus meters in the air in a rural area. And you know that's going to vary over time, right, uh, seasonally at the very least. So then you have to start investing about a year early, installing a meteorological tower, measuring the wind speed, collecting that data, analyzing that data. And even then, that's just one year, right? How representative is it? And, and back when I started uh, doing wind, I mean, that's sort of my background, um, it, it, it was a big barrier. And you can go on to uh, uh, you know, a, a, a website where there's plenty of databases where you can get NASA solar data and you feel quite confident about them. Of course, it's not predicting the weather, it's you know, longer periods, uh, but you can, that's all you need to design your solar system. You don't need to wait a year collecting data. Um, and, and so that's why, and that of course, solar now is so cheap that you don't see as much wind. Um, in addition, wind has maintenance problems, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, everyone, Christian. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the great talk. And I think you're really doing the yeah, meaningful job. And uh, my question is, uh, previously in the book, I read that this grid-based electrification system, like 
lose a lot of electricity energy during the distribution of electricity, even in the urban area. So I'm curious, like this kind of off-grid system can be applied to the urban area, and is it economically compatible, competitive? Yeah, compared to the yeah current grid system and how close we are getting there. Yeah, great question. So that depends on on the quality of the grid as it exists. Uh, anytime you, I mean, the big drawback in these off-grid systems, well, there's a, at least a few, but one of them is that you have to have batteries. Uh, the grid doesn't. Okay? So you have these batteries that you now need to, to manage and pay for. And so economically, it's probably not going to make sense. I mean, we could approach, so my KWH, we do advising for all sorts of organizations that are, that are trying to do, you know, maybe they're building a school or a medical clinic and they don't have the electrical engineering expertise. So we, we do some advising for them. But if the grid is right there, connect to the grid. That's, that's, it's going to be the cheapest. Now, if you're worried about the reliability of the grid, okay, put in some batteries, right? And then just charge them when the grid is available. Um, but I don't see the need to have, you know, this redundancy in these under-resourced areas of having, okay, the grid is right there, but we're also going to have solar panels and batteries. Sure, that's a nice luxury to have for res resiliency, but it, you're spending a lot of money on that. Uh, what you what you do see though in, in, in countries where the national grid is down, like in Nigeria, uh, you know, lots of load shedding, lots of problems like that. People will often have backup generators, and if it, you know, that's obviously can be expensive to operate. Um, but in situations like that where the grid is really really unreliable, then it pushes you towards having a, a you know a microgrid uh, for convenience at, at least. So yeah, maybe a couple of solar panels and some small batteries might, might work if you're in that situation. If your grid is reliable or as the grid is more reliable, it becomes less of a value to you, I would think. Thank you. Um, I was wondering how difficult is the sourcing and procurement of these technologies and is that something that's changed with time? Uh, it's not difficult. It's changed with time, but it's not difficult. Our, our approach, and this is the approach I would strongly recommend to anybody doing, trying to do something abroad, is to just use the local supply chain. Hire a Zambian company to source everything, install everything. We get approached by people who hear our story and say, we want to give you some batteries, we want to give you, we want to donate some solar panels. And boy, is it a headache to try to figure out how to ship those to Zambia, manage. If we're there, whatever. It, it's generally not worth it for us. Too much uncertainty, too much, you know, one-off stuff. So it's not that hard if you just commit to hiring in-country suppliers. They have that all worked out. They know how to do it. There might be some delays there, which are inescapable if they have problems, but yeah. So one more question in the chat. Um, about using pumped hydro uh, as another long-term storage technology, um, does is this something that you think is viable, or uh, is it not something that's particularly uh, viable for these systems? It's actually quite common, but maybe not in the way you think it would be. So when we have a solar pump, uh, most of them they don't have have batteries. They just pump water when it's sunny, and uh, they'll pump it up to a big elevated storage tank. And even and, and they might have a, a cutoff switch when the tank gets full, or the tank just might spill over. And then uh, when it's not sunny enough to pump water, you have the, the, you know, the water above. So we, we don't really see it in terms of pumping water up in this tank and then running it through a turbine. Uh, not at the, I mean, that, that, not at the scale that you would see it in a small community. I mean, it would be a pretty small turbine and you know, you'd probably spend more time figuring out the civil engineering side of it than it would be worth. So one more question I had is actually for uh, Kilowatts for Humanity, what is the primary funding source that you guys use? Um, I, know, I know it's a nonprofit, so what do you mostly rely on? Yeah, uh, so we're a volunteer driven nonprofit, so we don't have salaries or office space. Um, and, and so we rely on donors and grants for the most part. Uh, we sell some t-shirts, <laughs> we have fundraisers. Uh, it'll be on online this year, I'm almost 100% sure. But uh, yeah, we, we, we write grants and uh, we reach out to people that care about electricity access or energy poverty and, and, um, and some of them are able to write us checks every year. 
<laughs> so that's what we do. Thanks. All right, anybody else? Um, if not, I mean, it's three o'clock, so this is a good note for us to conclude on. Yeah, yeah you see um, some, uh, my con I think my screen share is still on, but uh, there's my contact information. You know, feel free to send me an email if you are more interested in this, this field, and uh, thanks for having me here. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, the talk was great, and thanks everyone for attending. Uh, we'll be doing this every month, so we'll send out um, more information about the December webinar. So uh, thanks everyone, and thanks Dr. Louie. Thank you.